in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the abracast. We are the brave and the bold. Wake up, son of mine. Mama got something to tell you. Changes come. Life will have its way with your pride, son. Take it like a man. Hang on, son of mine. A storm is blowing up your horizon. Changes come. Keep your dignity. Take the high road. And take it like a man. Listen up, son of mine. Mama's got something to tell you. It's all about growing pains. Life will pound away where the light don't shine, son. Take it like a man. Suck it up, son of mine. Thunder blowing up your horizon. Changes come. Keep your dignity. And take the high road and take it like a man. Mama said, like the rain, this too shall pass. Like a kidney stone, this too shall pass. It's just a broken heart, son. This pain will pass away. This is from V is for Viagra, I think. V is for Viagra. So it's a piece of her CD. The Abracast. A cult. History. Conspiracy and violence. Explicit content indicator. This means that I use adult language. I do not speak in a humorless public radio hushed monotone. I am excited and enthusiastic about the information that I present and the topics I discuss. You will hear ice rattle in my glass throughout the show. On the show, I joke about bodily functions, sex acts, religion, and politics. The topics may seem random or scattered through the back catalog. A list of show topics in chronological order is provided on the feature topic link at abercast.com. If any of these issues might trigger you, this might not be the podcast for you. And I wish you good luck finding a show more to your liking. It's that time again. The music is low. The party is over. The fire is dying down, and all the ordinary people passed out long ago. Now we are the only ones left. It's certainly V is for vagina. <laughs> I looked it up real fast, and I'm kicking myself. Why don't I know it? Or why didn't I prepare to have, to have it? It's one of these things where I just had a little bit too much confidence in myself. I am John Towers, and this is the Abercast. Um, I predict that we're going to be wrapping up, uh, the Enchiridion this evening. It's the handbook or the manual by this old philosopher named Epictetus. And it's only been, uh, four episodes, a lot different than the 30 something odd episodes of, uh, thus speak Zarathustra. But I do have something interesting in mind for going forward for, uh, uh, the Wednesday show. Um, it's not going to be book clubs anymore. I don't think instead, I think it's going to be more like philosophical Wednesdays. Anyhow, uh, before we get going here, let's see, by the time you're listening to this, I will be like 48 hours into the detrification fast. So if you're playing along at home, welcome. Also, if you're playing along at home, now is the time to grab your vessel of the art, uh, in which your uh, weapon of 
mass distraction is mixed up. Mine is a gin jihad as usual. And raise your vessel to the sky and say thank you to my Patreon and subscribe star supporters. Our supporter. Thank you to the Patreon and subscribe star support for our podcast. Mine and yours, my friend. And uh, let's see. Here's to a long life and a happy one, a quick death and an easy one, a good girl and an honest one, and a cold pint and another one. Here's to you. So um, I did the Mama Said song in the cold open because after doing the um, these Enchiridion episodes and understanding a little bit more about stoic philosophy to me it sounds like it's preaching stoic philosophy all right so where did we leave off here uh, dun, dun, dun. so there's a total of just a quick uh, note here about this work there's a total of 52 essays some are short and some are a little bit longer and we left off here at uh, number uh, 36. As the proposition, either it is day or it is night, is extremely proper for disjunctive arguments, but quite improper in a conjunctive one. So at a feast to choose the largest share is very suitable to the bodily appetite, but utterly inconsistent with the social spirit of entertainment. When you eat with another, then remember not only the value of those things which are set before you to the body, but the value of the behavior which ought to be observed towards the person who gives the entertainment. I see the wisdom in this. Um, Great Saver says, do not be a glutton, not only for your body's sake, but especially when dining with others as gluttony looks rude. 37. If you have assumed any character above your strength, you have both made an ill figure in that and a quitted one which you might have supported. Great Saver summarizes. Do not put on airs. Be yourself. 38. When walking, you are careful not to step on a nail or turn your foot so likewise, be careful not to hurt the ruling faculty of your mind. And if we were to guard against this in every action, we should undertake the action with the greater safety. Summary. Just as you protected your body, so too should you protect your mind with proper thinking and by other means. 39. The body is to everyone the measure of the possessions proper for it, just as the foot is of the shoe. If therefore you stop at this, you will uh, keep the measure. But if you move beyond it, you must necessarily be carried forward as down a cliff. As in the case of a shoe, if you go beyond its fitness to the foot, it comes first to be gilded, then purple, and then studded with jewels. For to that which one exceeds a due measure, there is no bound. Summary. If you write music, be sure to not utilize too many notes in one piece. That is, know your limitations. However, if you are one of those cherubs who refuse to be tied to the earth, fly and do so to the best of your abilities. 40. Women from 14 years old are flattered with the title of mistress by the men. Therefore, perceiving that they are regarded only as qualified to give men pleasure, they begin to adorn themselves and in that to place ill their hopes. We should therefore fix our attention on making them sensible that they are valued for the appearance of decent, modest, and discreet behavior. Decent, decent, modest, and discreet behavior. Uh, the summary, do not limit your aspirations nor abilities to fit your physical demeanor. What is inside you has far greater potential. Potential. No matter how you may adorn yourself externally. 41. 
Uh, it is the mark of want of genius to spend too much time in things relating to the body as to be long in our exercises and eating and drinking. Hold on, I got a drink to that. And in the discharge of other animal functions. I should probably drink to that too. These should be done incidentally and slightly and our whole attention be engaged in the care of the understanding. The summary. While we are like the animals in our physical desires and bodily needs, remember that it is with the mind and reason that we stand sublime. All right, so I got more um, uh, material from this guy named Sean Fulmer on a website called Alcation. And here I, I put this in here um, talking about the animal nature and desires. The first uh, experience of human consciousness is the animal desire that shapes the mental life of a person. Without ever thinking about it, a person is automatically embedded in a matrix of desires and actions. Sometimes action seems to lead to desired outcomes, and sometimes they don't. This desire system is experienced as a veil or a false understanding. The imagery of desire shows that a person believes that they can get what they want in life, but that is simply not the case, says Epictetus. Uh, by refusing desire, the true nature of life would become clear. And this is very interesting to me, just coming off of a little fast. Um, I, I had a thought sort of like this. My thought was, you know, <laughs> uh, when I'm withholding food for myself, I really don't care about not drinking. So take that however you want it. Um, let's see. 42. When a person harms you or speaks badly of you, remember that he acts or speaks from a supposition of it being his duty. Now, it is not possible that he should follow what appears right to you, but what appears so to himself. Therefore, if he judges from a wrong appearance, it is the person hurt, since he too is the person deceived. For if anyone should suppose a true proposition to be false, the proposition is not hurt, but is he who is deceived ab about it. Setting out, then, from these principles, you will meekly bear a person who reviles you. For you will say upon every occasion, it seems so to him. Those are also wise words. It seems like we're, we keep bumping up against this idea of <laughs> gossiping or not being able to mind your own fucking business. Um, the summary here for this is remember that those who might besmirch your name and gossip or to do so with the belief that they are correct in their assessment. They are at a loss if not to do so. Not you. Do not allow yourself to be angered by such offenses. This kind of reminds me of the story I was telling a couple weeks ago about the righteous indignation of the victim when I was when I was about to get arrested outside of my house because of that fist fight. Uh, 43, everything that has two handles, the one by which it may be carried and the other by which it cannot. If your brother acts unjustly, don't lay hold on the action by the handle of this injustice, for by that it cannot be carried. But by the opposite, that he is your brother and he was brought up with you, and thus you will lay hold on it as it is to be carried. All things, it can be said, this is the summary, sorry. All things, uh, it can be said, have two handles, two ways of being grasped, both figuratively and literally. These are by acceptance and by disavowal. If you are ill-treated by your brother, grasp the handle of the thing that allows you to accept it. It is your brother, after all, and so must be accepted without reprisal. So this is interesting. To me, this is kind of like, a, kind of, it is, might be talking about, like, a duality. Like, uh, 
everything has a handle. One might be material and one might be, uh, I don't know, like psychological or maybe spiritual. Um, it's funny how often I'm reading through Epictetus. It's funny how often it makes me think of, uh, in my, one of my prior lives, I was a supervisor of security for, um, uh, we'll just say a very well-known football team. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that I, I, uh, it, this specifically brings me to is uh, w- there's a technique called the calming hand, <laughs> which sounds kind of awesome, <laughs> but really it's not. It's literally just the calming hand. It's just to put your hand on the guy's shoulder and just be like, hey, bro, hey, everything's going to be okay. And uh, kind of talk to him. There's that, that guy has two handles, right? He's got two handles. The one is the calming hand and the other is the fucking headlock down the fucking stairs, throw, hold, (laughs) arm drag. (laughs) I got some fucking stories to tell you about that shit. I should talk about it more often. All right, I'll make a deal with you. From now on, whenever I come, whenever something that I'm reading makes me think of a, (laughs) a security story, um, I might let it go. It depends. Well, the statute of limitations is out on all of them. I haven't done this in quite a while, so I'm not in fear of legal repercussions. 44. These reasonings are unconnected. Quote, I am richer than you, therefore I am better. Unquote. I am more eloquent than you, therefore I am better. The connection is rather this. I am richer than you, therefore my property is greater than yours. Or I am more eloquent than you, therefore my style is better than yours. But you, after all, are neither property nor style. See things, people, and situations for what they truly are. The rich are not better than the poor. They are simply richer. (laughs) I got something to say about that. Uh, Therefore... The, the beautiful are more handsome and they're mean, uh, but nothing more. Apply this not only to others, but to yourself as well. So Colin Flaherty has this this thing that he does uh, where he's talking about consulting on PR matters or whatever for with super rich people. And he says there's an unspoken question in the air when you're consulting with super rich people. And they're like... Well, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? And Flaherty says, uh, the unspoken question that I have for that gentleman is if you, (laughs) if you're so rich, why are you so fucking stupid? (laughs) I'm paraphrasing. I don't think he says the fucking stupid, but I realize I haven't cursed much in this episode and I wanted to keep, I wanted to keep my disclaimer honest. Zing, I got him. 45. Does anyone bathe? In a mighty little time. My wife does, man. She's in and out of the shower like lickety split. I don't know if that's the right term. Lickety split. When I'm talking about my naked wife in the shower, lickety split. Sure. Yeah, that works. Don't say that he does it ill, but in a mighty little time, does anyone drink a great quantity of wine? Don't say that he does ill, but that he drinks a great quantity for unless you perfectly understand the principle from which anyone acts. How should you know if he acts ill? Thus, you will not run the hazard of assenting to any appearances, but such as you fully comprehend the summary. I'm sorry if I'm. I'm sorry if I'm sniffing. I'm trying to cough button out, but I'm having like a thing. I don't know what my problem is. All right, the summary. If a man does wrong and you feel you must speak of his wrongdoing, speak about it cleanly and evenly without embellishment or deviating from the wrongful acts. To do otherwise is to be deceitful and makes both of you worse off than you both began. Yeah, again, this is a thing we're picking up. Uh, Where did it... I can't remember where it started. It might... It probably started with one of the Mason episodes from a while back. Where I started talking about 
my this idea that I have that all the secrecy regarding masonry and all the foolishness that they get up to is just about learning to keep a fucking secret, learning to stay out of other people's bullshit. If I can't trust you with this, something as silly as a secret handshake, how can I trust you with, you know, a personal problem that I'm having or, you know, a financial issue or something that I need help with. Like if I can't trust you with this little bullshit, how can I trust you with this? And this touches back with the thing we had earlier this episode about uh, gossiping. Right. And um, also this kind of also links back to this, uh, the, the idea of the righteous indignation of the victim. If you're a victim or you have a point of view on an incident where you're about to vilify somebody, you know, maybe we should step back and uh, emotionally unattach or detach emotionally. That's a great way to put it. Detach emotionally. Uh, that's what I wish that I would have done with that cop when I was freaking out <laughs> outside. It says in the summary, without em embellishment or deviating from the wrongful acts. And this is something, um, again, like I said, I can't get over how many times this series has made me think of doing security work. You know, it's because of this, because when people feel slighted, man, it's their, it's their ego steps in and it gets all messy. And obviously I'm the same way, you know, uh, this stoicism episodes, have become kind of cathartic to me or realizing a huge flaw in my, in my personality. I don't know if any other podcast host would tell you that kind of stuff. I like, uh, I, I, um, I feel like I'm learning something, <laughs> but I am a little ahead of schedule, but I do need to get this done so we can even out on the backside. So hang tight. Are you the type of person who has to close and minimize windows before the boss can see? Are there things that you've seen that you dare not mention to the normies and pink boys you see shambling down the sidewalk? Have you taken one step too many down the rabbit hole? Well, fear not. You are always welcome on The Whole Rabbit, where we discuss things like chaos magic, Alistair Crowley, and the tarot. But that's not all. We decode the mysterious Illuminati symbolism in films like Midsummer, Joker, Dr. Sleep and Eyes Wide Shut. On The Whole Rabbit, we even discuss occult manuals like the Kabbalion and Abram Ellen the Mage. Here is wherever you most enjoy listening to podcasts, like Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much everywhere else podcasts are available. So tune in to The Whole Rabbit every week and join the conversation. And remember, eat carrots, shoot lasers. So this month on the Fulgar Correspondentia, just a fancy word for the mailing list. <laughs> um, since we're heading into the fourth quarter of our Genesis series, there's a little uh, brief Genesis timeline, according to me, um, that's that's up there. Uh, also, since we are going to be getting into Jacob and Esau, I finally sat down and s started to work on a map of the wrong son, the wrong son, the wrong blessing idea that we've been running into, uh, pretty much this whole Genesis thing, um, sat down and it worked out some pretty cool details. So I think it's pretty cool. Also, as always, you can look at my latest up to date, uh, version of the tarot cards that I'm designing all that. If you sign, if you just sign into the mailing list, all that bonus stuff but uh the fellow craft episode on the patreon and subscribe star this month um we're starting to look at and dissect the work of milton william cooper in uh episode entitled the ufo conspiracy part one learn more at abracast.com get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com.
46. Never call yourself a philosopher, nor talk a great deal among the unlearned about theorems, but act comfortably to them. Thus, at an entertainment, don't talk about how persons ought to eat, but eat as you ought. For remember that in this manner, Socrates also universally avoided all ostentation. And when persons came to him and desired to be recommended by him to philosophers, he took and recommended them so well <laughs> did he bear being overlooked so that if uh, ever any talk should happen among the unlearned concerning philosophic theorems, be you for the most part silent, for there is great danger in immediately throwing out what you have not digested. If anyone tells you that you know nothing and that you are not nettled at it, then you may be sure that you have begun your business for sheep don't throw up the grass to show the shepherds how much they have eaten. Wow. But inwardly digesting their food, they outwardly produce wool and milk. Thus, therefore, do you likewise not show theorems to the unlearned? Jesus Christ, this is great. I gotta write this down. But the actions produced by them after they have been digested. The summary goes on to say, But do not make a show of your knowledge. As a philosopher, even call yourself such further. Do not tell others how they should live, but rather live as you know is right. And so lead by example. This is from Nietzsche too, right? Well, the Nietzsche... Uh, Zarathustra talks about this kind of stuff. You can't seek out Zarathustra. He just happens to you. <laughs> He's like a force of nature. Forty-seven. When you have brought yourself to supply the necessities of your body at a small price, don't pique yourself upon it. Nor, if you drink water by be saying upon every occasion, I drink water, but first consider how much more sparing and patient of hardship the poor are than we. But if at any time you would in your yourself by exercise to labor and bearing hard trials, do it for your own sake. And not for the world. Don't grasp statues, but when you are violently thirsty, take a little cold water in your mouth and then spurt it out and tell nobody. This is like fasting, right? I gotta, there's a lot of synchronicities going on here. Maybe I'm secretly, unbeknownst to myself, a stoic, and I never even knew it. Uh, the summary, be patient in all things, including any hardships that you incur in your life. There are always others who have experienced worse. All right. So I found this bit on the Alcation. Who's this guy's name again? Sean Fulmer. And he writes about fate and judgment in Epictetus's handbook. And this is about fate and judgment. I thought this was a good place to put it. There is a narrative quality to human life, says the Stoic. This quality is shown in the imagery of fate and moral judgment. A person confronted by fate might respond immorally or unethically. This is a judgment against them and leads to mental chaos and suffering, says Epictetus. By accepting responsibility for one's choices, responsibility, and the prop, uh, properties of fate, one can do what the Hindus might call improving karma. This narrative imagery shows that humans tend to try to outmaneuver and control God. The imagery leads to surrender. All right. Uh, here we go. Right into uh, number 48. The conditions and characteristics of a vulgar person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> I'm just laughing because I have a bad feeling <laughs> about this one. 
is that he never expects either benefit or hurt from himself, but from externals. The conditions and characteristics of a philosopher is that he expects all hurt and benefit from himself. The marks of a, a proficient are that he censors no one, praises no one, blames no one, accuses no one, says nothing concerning himself as being anybody or knowing anything when he is in any instance hindered or restrained, he accuses himself. And if he is praised, he secretly laughs at the person who praises him. And if he is censured, he makes no defense, but goes about with the caution of a sick or injured people, dreading to move anything that is set right before it is perfectly fixed. He suppresses all desire in himself, and he transfers his aversion to those things only which thwart the proper use of our own faculty of choice. The exertion of his active powers towards anything is very gentle. If he appears stupid or ignorant, he does not care. In a word, he watches himself as an enemy. God, I'm sorry about the sniffing. And one in ambush. The Okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. The uh, summary great saver says here, see things for what they really are especially when you are at fault further control your desire to remember that, uh, the given situation, you could be your own best friend or your own worst enemy. So I, one of my other past lives, uh, I say that figuratively speaking, you know, you new agers out there might be like, Oh yeah, past lives. Me too. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, one of my other careers, I was in a very high stress, um, God, how do I say this without giving away too much? I was in a very high stress office environment and everybody was looking to save their own ass, especially when the ship started sinking. And I remember just being like, yeah, I fucked up. Let's how, look, here's how I'm going to fix it. Instead of people would spend hours in meetings pointing fingers and I would be like, God, this is so fucking pointless. Like who gives a fuck? Let's just figure out how to fix this thing. And, um, another thing I learned from that, uh, cer certain career was if anyone ever looks at you and says, I think that we have group think, I think that we, we, we're on the same page. I think that we're, we, you know, whatever corporate nonsense mumbo jumbo. If anyone says that you're thinking like they're thinking that we're thinking the same, we're on the same page, get the fuck out of the room. <laughs> Cause falling into that trap, you will just add, you need fresh thinking. You need the people around you, especially if you're making big decisions, you need people around you that do not think like you. That's the point of having people. That's the full point of having people. You know, it reminds me of like George Lucas when he was doing the prequel. Everything's coming back to Star Wars. <laughs> so, um, and like everyone was afraid to tell George Lucas like, hey, man, this really sucks. Like you should rewrite all of this before we start shooting it. The prequels I'm talking about, you know, with the trade guild and all this other Gungan nonsense. But everyone was just like, yeah, George, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be great. And look what we got. The second worst <laughs> Star Wars trilogy uh, in the world. Second only to Disney. So uh, Sean Fulmer at Alcation also writes this thing about Epictetus and the caste system. And I thought was, this would be an interesting place to put it. So he says, Epictetus argues that people are essentially playing roles within a caste system. And he explains that he says that there are people whose lives are obviously centered around the spiritual reality. And there are those who are so embedded in their physical reality that the questions of spirit seem bizarre and irrelevant to them. The motive, uh, 
motif might remind readers of the Hindu concept of Brahma and the Buddhist interpretation of it. This is one of those many similarities between Stoicism and Buddhism. And if you remember why I wound up doing the Stoicism business, it was with um, my uh, Patreon, our Patreon supporter, uh, Ryan. At the end of our talk, we started talking about philosophy and Gnosticism. And... I had mentioned that I had heard that the Stoics were tied into Gnosticism or had a lot of things in common with Gnosticism. And now I see it totally. Um, but, uh, you know, we also can link Gnosticism to, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, karma, all, all of that. All right. 49. When anyone shows himself overly confident in the ability to understand and interpret the works of, oh boy, Chrysippus, to say to yourself, unless Chrysippus had written obscurely, this person would have no subject for his vanity. But what do I desire to understand nature and to follow her? I ask then who interprets her and finding Chrysippus does I have recourse to him. I don't understand his writings. I seek, therefore, one to interpret them. So far, there is nothing to value myself upon. And when I find an interpreter, what remains is to make use of his instructions. This alone is the valuable thing. But if I admire nothing but merely the interpretation, what do I become more than a grammarian instead of a philosopher, except indeed that instead of Homer, I interpret Chrysippus, Chrysippus. And when anyone therefore desires me to read Chrysippus to him, uh, I rather blush when I cannot show my actions agreeable. Consonant to his discourse. Okay, I'm really going to need this summary to help me figure this out, which I think is... <laughs> I think it's fitting because he's kind of talking about reading something you don't understand. It seems like, right? Do not display your knowledge unduly. Also, do not try to understand difficult writings by only understanding um, others who have interpreted such writings. Rather, it behooves you to understand the writings directly or, if unable to do so, never mention these writings to others as though you understood them yourself. Behoove. It's a word we don't use very often anymore. Outside of, you know, boot camp. It would behoove you. Fifty. Whatever moral rules you have deliberately proposed to yourself... Abide by them as they were laws and as if you would be guilty of impiety by violating any of them. Don't regard what anyone says of you for this. After all, is no concern of yours. How long then will you put off thinking yourself worthy of the highest improvements and follow the distinctions of reason? You have received the philosophical theorems which... You ought to be familiar, and you have been familiar with them. What other master, then, do you wait for to throw upon the delay of reforming yourself? But you are no longer a boy, but a grown man. If, therefore, you will be negligent and slothful and always add procrastination to procrastination, purpose to purpose, and fix day after day in which you will attend to yourself, you will... Insensibly continue without proficiency in living and dying, persevere in being one of the vulgar. This instant, then, think of yourself worthy of living as a man grown up and as a proficient. Let whatever appears to be the best be to you an inviolable law. 
and of any instance of pain or pleasure or glory or disgrace is set before you. Remember that now is the combat. Now is the Olympiad comes on, nor can it be put off. By once being defeated and given way, proficiency is lost, or by the contrary, preserved. Thus, Socrates became perfect, improving himself by everything, attending to nothing but reason. And though you are not yet a Socrates, you ought, however, to live as one desirous of becoming a Socrates or Socrates. The summary says, be secure in these philosophical rules that you have placed upon yourself. Let the biting words of others fall upon deaf ears. Be adult in your action. This means avoidance of sloth. What is up with my runny nose and procrastination? And if the other bad habits that you are aware of attempt to perfection as Socrates did and achieved. Here we go. 51. The first and most necessary topic in philosophy is that of the use of moral theorems such as we ought not to lie. The second is that of demonstrations such as what is the origin of our obligation not to lie. And the third gives strength and articulation to the other two. What is the origin of this is a demonstration for what is demonstration? What is consequence? What is contradiction? And what is truth? What falsehood? The third topic then is necessarily on the account of the second and the second on the account of the first. But uh, the most necessary is that whereon we ought to rest is the first. But we act just on the contrary, for we spend all of our time on the third topic and employ all of our diligence about that, the entire and entirely neglect the first. Thereof, the same time that we lie, we are immediately prepared to show how it is demonstrated that lying is not right. <laughs> I love it. When uh, this is the summary. Great saver. When practicing and considering these and other rules of living that you have taken upon yourself, consider why these laws exist, their value, their reason in their value. Do not lose yourself in the philosophical aspect of such questioning. However, mere consideration without practice are a waste of time and are falsely ethical in doing this. And all of these standards of living, you may one day die, but you will never truly be harmed. Love it. And, uh, Sean Fulmer from the, from Alcation, uh, did this bit on Epictetus and the human soul. And I thought this was a good place for it. Uh, the Stoic Handbook intentionally elaborates an imagery of the human soul. On one hand, the imagery is fairly obvious. On the other hand, however, the human nature often prohibits humans from analyzing objectively and rationally because of his desires of the human soul. I would also add probably ego. A person can take a biased Okay, here we go. Emotional position by becoming more stoic in one's belief. One must divorce their mind from the rat race of animal desire and animal happiness. Then the soul becomes more obvious, says the philosopher. I mentioned earlier about emotional deta detaching the emotion. Deta what, how did I mention? How did I say it? Emotionally detaching, probably something like that. All right, here goes. This is the last one, bros. 52. Upon all occasions, we ought to have these maxims ready at hand. Conduct me, Jove, and you, O oh, destiny. Wherever your decree have fixed my station, 
I follow cheerfully, and did I not? Wicked and wretched, I must follow still. Whoever yields properly to fate is deemed wise among men and knows the laws of heaven. And the third, O Crito, if it thus pleases the gods, then let us be. Antius and Melitus may kill me indeed, but hurt me they cannot. So there's no uh, summary for this. But I did find um, in uh, Sean Fulmer's piece on allocation, this um, a piece on orienting one's self to face fate, orienting one's self to fate. And he says, the Stoic philosophy has religious aspects because Epictetus and other similar philosophers navigating one's relationship to God is part of the living and healthy and a good life. This means accepting fate because by rejecting one's fate, a person attempts to manipulate God. We touched on this earlier. This is deeply ironic because by definition, a human being cannot control God. Yet, when confronted by fate, it is the first human response. The narrative quality of fate seems to be ceding back control to God for a stoic religious person. So, I hope that you guys like this. Uh, I actually learned quite a bit. It's actually spurned me more uh, into philosophy. Um... I wonder what it's done to you. <laughs> I'm John. This is the Abercast, and uh, I've got a. I believe I have a special treat for you on Friday. Uh, I don't. It's not done yet, so I don't want to blow it in case it falls through. But uh, stay tuned, especially if you like the Kabbalah. You know that Jewish mysticism. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for your support. And, uh, yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. You learned something? Did you laugh? Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows, as well as the exclusive Fellow Craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. You supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I'm proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition uh, to creating the show that you dig... And that you are excited about, I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So, why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in on the quality and development of the podcast. 
And what if you can't afford, you know, one dollar or three dollars or ten dollars or whatever a month? Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you could sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback, support, and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going. 